everybody. This is Heather with Ghost Education 101, and I am joined today with Philip and Brandon Masulo. Brandon is our guest speaker today, and he is going to be presenting the science of ghosts, I believe was the topic that you have today. That's right. Uh, and just real quick, you guys, make sure you follow us on Facebook, as well as you can watch this replay on YouTube. I will be sharing the links throughout the presentation so you know where to find us. And a quick introduction. Um, thank you, Brandon, for joining us. Thank you. And for those of you who don't know who Brandon is, he is a clinical therapist, author, and parapsychologist residing in Northeast Ohio. He has graduate degrees in clinical counseling from the University of Toledo and a psycholo or psychological research methods from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. His research has centered on EMFs and ghostly encounters, and he studied with the, sorry guys, I hope I don't destroy this name, the Colster Parapsychology Unit um, at the University of Edinburgh. He is um, very fascinated with the paranormal phenomenon for 20 years and has participated and been a featured speaker in numerous paranormal forums, including uh, Coast to Coast AM and Parapsychology Association's 60th anniversary celebration. Um, you can find all of his research um, cited in journals, newspaper articles, and mainstream books. And guys, don't forget, I'm going to pull that link up so you can see it. Make sure you, oh, there's his book. And here's where you can find him on Facebook. And I guess I'm going to hand this over to Brandon. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the great introduction, too. Um, so w what I'm going to do today is just what I, I call it a, a fun presentation on the science of ghosts. Uh, so uh, I would say it's sort of a prequel to my book. Uh, it's sort of an introduction to it. And then, you know, if you're really interested in what I'm saying, I think the book is a nice next step. Uh, so I'm going to try to do this. I've never done the sharing thing. No one's ever had enough confidence to make me a, a host or anything in Zoom meetings. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me. I trust you. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot. And if, if everyone's ready, we'll just get going here. Okay. All right. It worked before, so. All right. Is it sharing? Not yet. Not yet? Oh, there boy. we go. It's up. it's up. All right. All right. So let's get going here. Obviously, title is The Science of Ghosts. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today really starts with the survival hypothesis. And the survival hypothesis is something I talk about pretty much every time someone uh, is kind enough to invite me on a show or podcast or presentation like this. But it's basically this idea that um, some part of us, whether that's our consciousness, our soul, our spirit, whatever, continues to exist after we, we die or move on. Now, it's the idea that sort of our personality, who we are, uh, everything about us sort of continues to exist. And, and that's really what ghosts, uh, if you really want to boil down to, are. So when we when we talk about studying ghosts, we're really talking about this idea of a survival hypothesis, right? Does some part of us go on, our memory, who we are? Now, um, sort of mainstream science or neuropsychology sort of paints us as uh, computers, robots, um, and that our memories are just uh, electrons firing, and our emotions, our identity, who we are is just a collection of these uh, electrical impulses that are happening. And, you know, it's 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 kind of disturbing the sort of the, the fatality of that for a lot of people. Um, you know, so the survival hypothesis really says that maybe there's something else that happens. What that something is, we don't really know. Uh, um, you know, there's there's reincarnation, there's, you know, afterlife, there's heaven, there's hell, there's ghosts, there's all these sort of different uh, beliefs about that. But that's really what, what we're going to look at today is a survival hypothesis. So uh, just a little bit about me briefly. It, it, you know, I, the book I have is The Ghost Studies. Um, I, I have some, a couple graduate degrees from the University of Edinburgh and, and uh, University of Toledo. Uh, I do have a lot of research uh, out there. Environmental sensitivity is something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in this presentation. Uh, I also have a, a co-authored a couple articles recently, Things That Go Bump in the Literature, which is um, it's a really great article if you're interested in haunted houses. It goes over sort of the last 20 years of research into environmental 
variables that are that happen in haunted locations. So it's a nice, concise way to look over the last 20 years of research. And that article is free in, on Frontiers in Psychology. Uh, it's an open journal that everyone has access to. And then Environmental Gestalt Influences is another article I did. And then I just published another one on enchantment and paranormal tourism. So th there's a lot of great research out there that I think um, a lot of people would really benefit from. Uh, the first one, I, there's a lot of journals out there that are really helpful too. Uh, so we'll get into a little bit that in a little bit. But this is basically who I am. Uh, I, I, I had a really good introduction, so I don't really have to talk anymore about me, which is great because I don't like doing that. Uh, so the, the things we're going to explore today. All right, here's the questions we're going to kind of try to tackle. You know, how has science really explored the survival hypothesis or ghosts? Uh, some of the things we'll talk about, can you weigh the human soul? Can we talk to the dead? Uh, can we create apparitions? Okay. Uh, and are some people more prone to ghostly encounters? So we're going to go over sort of the last 100 years or so of how science has really start tr tried to tackle some of these questions. Okay. So I think it's only fitting to start off with a ghostly encounter. There's millions of these baffling encounters that happen pretty much every day all over the world. Uh, and with so many ghostly encounters, there's really few answers. And this is a good one right here. Uh, the, uh, and I'll just read it off to you. The, the first night at Fort Magruder Inn in Williamsburg, Virginia, I woke up with the feeling you get when someone is standing behind you. Uneasily, I rolled over only to be confronted by a ghastly sight a young Civil War soldier standing by my bed, staring at me. He was very young, no more than 15 or 16, and wore a light-colored brownish-gray clothing. Half of his face had been shot away. I could hardly bear to look at him. He was so utterly miserable. Go away, please, I pleaded with him. Go to the light. Please just go to the light. He returned for two more nights, never saying anything, never moving from that rigid corpse-like position. And this is out of uh, a Haunted Ohio series by uh, Chris Wood Woodyard which is, I think she has four or five books, which is really great. They always have these, these fascinating stories in them. Uh, even if you're not from Ohio, I think they're still kind of interesting to read. But, but this is really nice because, as I talked about before, this is kind of a typical ghostly encounter, and, and, and science really hasn't figured it out. You know, I, I say in the book they drop the ball when it comes to explaining ghostly encounters. So these things are kind of explained away uh, as hallucinations, misinterpretations, uh, overactive imaginations, and individuals who've had these sort of terrifying encounters sometimes are, are left to struggle to find the answers. And sometimes they get the answers from reality TV shows. Uh, and, and this is where they're getting a lot of their information because it's there, it's accessible, and you know it's nice to feel like maybe you're not alone if you've had a ghostly encounter. You could flip on Travel Channel or the, the, the numerous, numerous other ones. Yeah. And so here's another ghostly encounter. My father passed away quietly in the hospital around 3 p.m. that day. We had a very special relationship, and I definitely considered myself a daddy's girl. This isn't my experience. Uh, he was passing a shock. He, his passing was a shock to the whole family. Overwhelmed with sadness, worry, and fear, I laid down on the couch as soon as I got home that evening. It must have been around 8 p.m. when my encounter occurred. While lying on the couch, an overwhelming sense of comfort overcame me. As I sat up, I saw an image of my father. I wasn't scared, just shocked. He walked toward me and whispered, don't be sad. He then rubbed my shoulders, which is what he would do to ease my sadness when I was a teenager. The encounter made me smile, even though it only lasted seconds, and then he slowly faded away. So it's, it's really interesting that the experience that we talked about before was terrifying and fearful. This experience is comforting and meaningful. So... There's two opposite sort of reactions and emotions associated with ghostly encounters. And this is always something that fascinated me as well. Um, one could be comforting, one could be terrifying. You know? and, and I think that's what makes sometimes ghostly encounters so significant and special to us. Sometimes the meaning behind them as well. So when I, when I go through you know, my, my history and sort of getting into parapsychology and, and ghosts, one of the things that I always wondered was, you know, what causes ghosts? Why is this house haunted? Why is this one not? You know, people die all the time. Shouldn't we be overrun with ghosts? Um, so I, I began studying the ghostly phenomenon. And, and the first thing I found out was it's very challenging to study ghostly encounters in a, a, sort, of a, a sort of a logical, scientific way. 
just because the you know the the, the phenomenon are uh, episodic they're random uh, they're erratic they're poorly documented and, and these are all the things that that sort of the scientific method really hates so you know as anyone probably listening to this is interesting interested in ghosts interested in finding out some answers interested in finding out how do I get reliable data well, you know what are the keys uh, and, and I think that, you know, the first step is really keeping an open mind. And, you know, I know a lot of people, when they do investigations, they say they keep an open mind, but sometimes it's really hard to do that. You almost have to present each location like it's a new, um, it's, it's a new place, it's a new topic, it's a new hypothesis when you walk in there. And I even know sometimes people in this audience are very skeptical of paranormal phenomenon. And they believe that this is sort of the paranormal phenomenon is a resort of fraud or attention-seeking behavior, uh, mental illness, uh, whatever sort of explanation some people have towards it. So my role here is not to convince anyone that ghost spirits or anything like that exists, but rather to acknowledge that millions of people each year report these ghostly phenomena, which warrants investigation. So keeping an open mind towards those who report paranormal, pheno paranormal phenomenon helps us better understand it. You know, nobody can dispute the fact that people experience apparitions. Right? So instead of arguing of whether these ghosts um, are real or not real or natural or supernatural, I like to focus on more about the experience. So instead of asking, do you believe in ghosts or do ghosts exist, we should instead be asking, do you believe that people experience encounters? And I think the answer to that is yes, no matter who you ask. People do experience apparitions. Right? It's, it's fairly common. And it's getting, I feel like it's getting more common with some of the statistics that are coming out there. Um, so, you know, it, is, is seeing an apparition 100% mean it's the ghost of a deceased person or spirit or an entity? No, there could be other reasons. You know, there's numerous natural reasons why someone could experience an apparition. Um, so I, I think that's why the open mind is an important part of, of anyone who really wants to get into um, learning more about researching ghosts or the science of ghosts. Um, now, like I said before, ghostly encounters are common, and there's millions of people who experience these ghostly phenomena. And here are just some basic statistics that I pulled. 68% of Americans hold at least one paranormal belief. 37% believe that houses could be haunted. 32% thought that spirits of the dead could return to certain places or situations. Now, these are polls from 2005. I've seen more recent ones, which suggest that the numbers are going up. Um, the one thing I found interesting with these polls was that the number of Americans who reported seeing dead people has doubled over the over the, the past decade. So. 9% said they interacted with a ghost in 1996 compared to 18%, uh, and this was done in 2006. So you, we can see the, the jump in numbers. I don't know what it would be now. Uh, I suspect it would probably even be a little higher. Uh, so that's always an interesting thing to look at, you know, because uh, it, it's shifting to the point where maybe more people have paranormal beliefs than people who don't have paranormal beliefs. So as we get into trying to figure out, you know, the science of ghosts, how is how is uh, academia or science been studying ghosts? I think we have to go back to actually when it all began, and you could look at accounts as early as AD 100, uh, where where Pliny the Younger documented haunt type phenomenon. He has uh, I I, don't, I never know if I, I say his name right. I think it's Pliny or. But he has letters, and in some of the letters he talks about haunt type of phenomenon that are happening in A.D. 100. Uh, Robert Boyle, who was a British phys physicist and chemist, was actually the first scientist to take this topic seriously. And he chronicled sort of poltergeist activity that was happening in a haunted house in 1612. The real boom for paranormal uh, investigations and, and sort of the world taking it more seriously was in 1882 when the Society for Psychical Research was created. And they really carried out formal scientific research into paranormal phenomenon. And the members of the SPR, the Society for Psychical Research, included very prominent scientists and even a prime minister, 
was part of this, of the UK. Uh, so if, if you ever do any research into the SPR, it's really amazing because it'd be like today taking all the top scientists, all the no Nobel Prize winners, all the, um, the best of the best in all the, the disciplines of science and having them focus on paranormal or ghost type stuff. Uh, it's almost like unheard of nowadays, but that's really what the SPR was. It was a collection of really, really smart people uh, who, who were just very curious and fascinated with the topic and they wanted to take it on. Um, at that time, spiritualism was sort of running rampant throughout not only the UK, but the world and you know the, the US as well. Uh, so I think science had to step in and say, well, wait a minute, some of this is not happening. But as they were sort of deb debunking or finding out that there was some fraud going on, they also found some legitimate cases. So uh, it wasn't all just debunking. I think that's an important thing to think about too. Right. So who studies the paranormal phenomenon? Right. So Google Scholar is, it's, it's basically Google, but instead of searching the whole internet, you're searching um, books, academic articles, uh, journals, uh, these types of things. So uh, if you go into Google Scholar and you're looking for a paper on the, I don't know, the, the cognitive behavioral therapy and it's a it's an impact on depression you type in cognitive behavioral therapy and it'll show you all the research from the journal of psychology from frontiers in psychology about cognitive behavioral therapy but you can go into google scholar and type in anything really so i typed in hauntings in google scholar and that's 866 scientific articles were referencing hauntings so sometimes people come up to me and go, well, you know, nobody studies the paranormal ghosts. It's not necessarily true. There's a lot of people studying the paranormal, not just in parapsychology, which is the field of study concerned with the investigation of paranormal and psychic phenomenon, such as telepathy, precognition, and all those types of things. But this is happening outside of parapsychology as well. Uh, this is happening in, in, in psychology. This is happening in um, sociology. This is happening in anthropology. This is happening in marketing, uh, tourism journals. Uh, this is a very common thing where people are really studying paranormal phenomenon and the experiences that people are having with it. I've typed in paranormal. I got two, 2,360 articles referencing paranormal, uh, 2,500 articles referencing apparitions. So there is a collection of this science or academic information that's really available at your fingertips on, on Google Scholar. There's numerous other websites you can go to, too, to, to sort of parcel, parcel your way through all the academic papers on paranormal or hauntings. But it's, it's, it's a great place to start. So if, if you are interested in, in poltergeist, you type in poltergeist and you get all the academic research that's really been done on poltergeist. Um, so all great stuff. And as, as someone who is starting out in the field or someone who has been in the field for 20 years, you could still go on Google Scholar and get the most up-to-date information as far as how it goes with science. So when people come up to me and say, oh, you know, there's not enough people studying it uh, professionally or academically, that's not necessarily the case. You know, and who studies the paranormal phenomenon today? Uh, the Society for, for Psychical Research we talked about earlier. Uh, you could become a member of the SPR. It's really great. It's really cheap. You can get access to all their webinars. You can get access to all these types of things. Parapsychological Association, um, they have a lot of great information. The University of Virginia has a division of perceptual studies. Uh, that They focus a lot on reincarnation. I think uh, their website has a bunch of books, uh, a bunch of articles. I think they even have sort of like a paranormalish museum in their facility I've heard about. And then uh, IONS, which is the Institute of Noetic Sciences, also has uh, does a lot of research. I believe uh, Dean Radin is the person who's over there. Um, but the Institute of Noetic Sciences is was actually founded by a former astronaut, Edgar Mitchell. So, um, you know, a pretty prominent guy uh, in seventy in the seventies and eighties, Edgar Mitchell was. Okay. So now we know a little bit about. Who's studying it? How much research is out there? Let's get to some of the questions that we talked about before, a little bit more entertaining part of this. So the first question is, it seems odd, right? Why is this guy picking this question? Uh, can you weigh the human soul? All right. 
The reason I'm asking that question is because someone tried to do that. Uh, I, I'm sure some people have heard of the 21 grams experiment by Dr. Duncan McDougall in 1907. Uh, I actually learned about this relatively recently, probably within the last 10 years. Uh, and, and I was sort of fascinated with it for a while. But uh, he published his, his research in uh, the American Medical, the American Medicine Academic Journal, and it was published in the New York Times. And he believed that the soul had substance. And anything that has substance takes up space. And anything that takes up space must have weight. So his theory was when people die, you know, if the soul weighs something and it takes up space when they die and the soul leaves their bodies, I should be able to find that out, right? So we put six dying patients on a um, specially constructed bed with measurement equipment. And he conducted, uh, and he concluded that at the moment of death, there was a loss of, in weight, of about three quarters of an ounce or 21 grams. So he said when people die, they lost weight of 21 grams. And he believed that this sudden and unexplained loss of, of weight at death was proof that the human soul existed and escaped at death. Uh, there was a movie, 21 Grams. Uh, I never saw it. I heard it was horrible. But uh, so this is sort of a popular thing, um, which you don't, you can read the whole journal article. If you just type in Duncan McDougall, you'll be able to find it. Uh, it's, it's kind of enlightening because, you know, his results were sort of inconsistent. Um, one out of the six people he measured actually lost this 21 grams. So one out of six is not the best odds. Um, so out of the six tests, two had, two had to be discarded. Uh, one showed an immediate drop in weight. Two showed a drop in weight, which increased in the passage of time. Um, and then one showed an immediate drop in weight, which reversed itself and later reoccurred. And he also had a very hard time determining the exact moment of death. Right? Uh, so nowadays we have EEGs hooked up to patients, we have monitors, we have all kinds of this electrical equipment, which can kind of give physicians a better idea of, of when death occurs. But I think even now it's, it's somewhat of a judgment call to some degree. Uh, so he had a, a difficult time in a lot of areas. Uh, his, his research has really been poked and prodded a, a fair amount. And a lot of physicians that I read believe that the loss of weight or the fluctuation of weight uh, was accounted for by other natural processes that occurred at death. So uh, a lot of times his theories are sort of debunked uh, I don't think anyone ever tried to redo his, his experiment. I don't know if you can do it today or how you would really get that done today. But one of the main things that came out of his research was uh, something I call, I, I don't know how I call it, but I think it was kind of horrible. Uh, a lot of times, I don't know if I say a lot of times, but sometimes we'll hear people say that animals don't have souls. You know, dogs don't have souls, this type of stuff. Any of us who are pet owner, owners sort of cringe at that. Um, uh, but he did experiments with dogs, and when the dogs died, there was no loss of weight, which came, when, and that's when he came to the conclusion that dogs don't have souls. And that sort of spread throughout pop culture and all this type of, uh, it still sort of hangs around to some degree now in 2021 that animals don't have souls. And I think that's really traced back to him. Um, so this was this was debunked as well. Um, they talked about how dogs and animals um, have different sort of sweat glands. So at death, there's loss of moisture. And th th so this this idea that, that, you know, dogs don't have souls or that there's a lot of reasons why the dog, uh, you know, didn't lose weight uh, at death. But anyway, so th this is something where science said, all right, let's take a let's take a stab at trying to figure out what the soul is, and, and and does it leave? Does the body change at death? Is is something happening? Is some part of us leaving? Is a part of us a spirit, a soul? Is something happening when we die? And um, as as much as he sort of messed this up, uh, at the same time he's he's taking this seriously, and he's really scientifically trying to figure something out. Right? So the next question I'll talk about is, can we talk to the dead? I know a lot of people listening to this will 
kind of say, yeah, we can. There's people out there that adamantly believe this. Um, when it comes to uh, science or academia, we have to. Th there's this idea that we have to consistently prove that something is happening. Um, so, you know, it's a little different than belief uh, when it comes to this science part of things. So, there's a lot of prominent scientists, um, very notable ones, who have taken up this idea of can we talk to the dead? One of them is Thomas Edison. Now, a lot of times we hear about Thomas's Thomas Edison's belief that he was going to make a um, I'm never going to say it. I think it's a spirit phone or ghost phone, which was a device where you can pick up the phone and talk to the deceased. But uh, actually, earlier than that, he developed something called the Spirit Finder. And you can this article here is just straight out of uh, uh, Literary Digest in 1921. And it actually, I know you can't see it on mine, but you can pull it up on the Internet. It's obviously free. And you can zoom in and read the whole article. But the Spirit Finder was Edison's first attempt at trying to sort of detect the ghost in the area. So it's the earliest EMF meter, if you want to think about it like that, the earliest way to detect something that's happening. So he thought that he he thought that what, what happened was uh, he, he had a beam of light. Um, and, and what it would do was uh, a beam of light was coming from a lamp, and it would be able to detect small particles in the air. And his theory was that if a ghost exists, it would consist of some particles, right? And this machine, in theory, would be able to detect this. So what he did was he put his assistant in a laboratory at night. You could sort of see the machine here. And his assistant sat in a laboratory all night and watched this beam um, to see if anything happened. Spoiler alert, nothing happened. Uh, he wasn't able to, to find a spirit or detect a ghost or anything along those lines. But... This is again the first time we're now not we're not really using um, measurements and uh, uh, beds and weights to determine if a spirit's around. Now we're advancing a little bit. Now we're using modern technology. At the time, we're using uh, you know lamps and particle detectors, and he's got all kinds of stuff happening here. So now we see we're moving away from standard things, and we're getting a little bit more complicated with it. And Edison is a great example of someone who's a very prominent person who's taking up this idea of spirit communication. Right. So next we have, and I, I'm always curious, so you know, when we end the conversation, please let me know, or the presentation, let me know if you even heard of the soul phone. Because the soul phone has been in development for five, six years. And essentially what the soul phone is, is it's basically a device to communicate with the deceased. And I'll kind of read, this is directly from their website. The soul phone refers to a combination of integrative technologies being developed by Dr. Gary Schwartz and a team of his colleagues at the Laboratory for Advances in Consciousness and Health at the University of Arizona. The purpose of the program is to develop working prototypes of accurate technologies for communicating with post-material persons. All right, so post-material persons, we could, it's, I guess it's a politically correct term for people who passed on, who aren't material anymore. <laughs> uh, it has been demonstrated that at least some of them want to continue relationships and help us advance personal and planetary peace and wellness. Okay, so it's basically they're developing ways to communicate with the dead. Right? Now, when we think of someone who is developing communication or tools to communicate with the dead. I think a lot of us might come with this, you know, idea of this guy in a basement with wacky hair and, you know, plasma balls all around him and doing things like that. Uh, and, and we think to ourselves, you know, listen, we can't take this seriously. But that's actually the opposite when it comes to the soul phone. One of the people who's leading it up is a, a guy by the name of Dr. Gary Schwartz. He has numerous books out there, uh, but he's a professor of psychology, medicine, neurology, psychiatry, and surgery at the University of Arizona. He's got a PhD in psychology from Harvard. Um, he was a professor at Harvard for a number of years. Uh, he served as a professor of psychology and psychiatry at Yale University.
and the director of the Yale uh, here, uh, right there. So this is a guy with who went to Harvard, you know, taught at Yale, did all these great academic things, and he's putting a lot of time, effort, money, and passion into into developing technology which can communicate with the deceased. So this is a huge step forward. Uh, this is sort of like you know people taking this seriously. You know, all these experiences that people have been having for centuries, you know, we always think it's just dismissed. Well, there are a lot of scientists who are really taking this very seriously and trying to, to not only see if it's happening, but, I mean, he's not, he's not shy about this. He actually, I mean, he's adamant that you can, can talk, that you can talk to uh, post-material people, um, and, and he wants to really prove. Uh, so if I'll go with the soul phone, you know, there, there's a, it's a pretty complicated process to some degree, but it's also very simple to some degree. So when I talk about the soul phone, what Dr. Schwartz found was that spirits could manipulate light or create light through photo emissions, even in completely dark areas. And he used these things called photomultipliers, and he was able to detect very small amounts of light, light that the, the naked eye couldn't see. So what this basically boils down to is you put these light sensors in a box. Now a light sensor uh, is a small little piece of equipment and what it can do is determine the amount of light that's happening around it. So we put this light sensor in a box, in another box, in another box, and he sort of created this light tight environment. And then he had mediums come in and, he, and the mediums asked the spirits to, sh to influence the light. So in other words, go inside this box and create light, right? <clears throat> and it worked. And he did these baseline experiments where he just had the sensor in the box. No one was messing with it. No mediums were telling ghosts to go in it, nothing like that. And what he found was that there was three photons per minute. So these sensors are, are so delicate, they could actually pick up light even in a dark space. So there still is photons or, or, or light in these little boxes. And then when the mediums... Um, communicated to the deceased, their spirits, and told them, hey, go in that box and mess and create light. There were 12 photons per five minutes. So this is a significant difference. And this is something that he has, uh, he's written a couple books on, there's research articles on this. Uh, so an, essentially what you have is a light sensor in a box and when the medium tells a ghost to go in it, the light is getting brighter than it does at baseline, right? So. You know, the soul phone technology is not really out there about sort of how they're doing it. He has a lot of research articles that are really interesting on this the light. There's other things on there about, uh, I mentioned plasma globes and things like that. But really, and this is straight from their website as well, they're developing all these technologies. Uh, the soul switch, which is a binary switch, which allows the spirit to communicate by signaling yes or no. They hope to get to the point where they can get a soul keyboard. And um, basically, that's where you can text uh, <laughs> a spirit or communicate via keyboard through a spirit. Soul voice, which is a which is where they feel like they can get to where humans hear those who have tra have transition. And then soul video, which enables humans to actually have visual images of those who have crossed over. Sure. Now, I mentioned the soul phone. It's not really at the point where they're they're um, it, it's public knowledge about what's happening. They are, you can follow their website and their Facebook page. They have updates. They're supposedly starting to do, they're going to start to do live presentations of this in, in 2021. I think they were trying to do it in 2020, but uh, I don't know if you anyone heard there was a pandemic. Uh, so they didn't do that anymore. Um, so keep an eye out. I'm really interested in it. I know I'm going to be uh, peeking in on them. I think it might be virtual and things like that. So uh, the cell phone is out there. Uh, it's being developed by some top people in the field, right? So it's important to keep that in mind. So science is trying, okay? <laughs> um, the next one is can we create apparitions? This is this is fun for me, right? I don't know if anyone's ever heard of a psychomantium. Right? A psychomantium is um, it's kind of a more I don't even know. I guess it's an ancient term that's been used more modern in more modern times right um, but basically it's mirror gazing techniques uh, it's a little different than scrying 
but it's sort of in the same ballpark. But it was used by ancient Greek oracles to contact the dead. Uh, so those who wanted to consult with the departed would gaze into a reflective surface, such as a pool of water, and then their surroundings would sort of slip away. They entered an altered state of consciousness. The surface would become a mystical conduit to the spirit realm, and then they would sort of uh, communicate with whoever they wanted to talk to. So these pictures here on the on, on my right side is the Oracle of Delphi. Uh, this was a very prominent uh, mystic, if you want to call it that, uh, in ancient Greek times. Uh, and the people who would go in there would sort of utilize these mirror gazing techniques, to, and they called it a psychomantium at the time. Um, so that's really where it started. Now, psychomantium is actually a term that's been brought more back into popularity by Dr. Raymond Moody. Uh, Dr. Moody, you might have you might have heard of him. He's the guy that coined the term near-death experience in his book. Uh, I want to say it was in the late 70s, maybe early 80s, um, was really the, the first academic study of near-death experiences. Um, but he wanted to find a way to experience apparitions in a controlled environment. So he used these elements from the ancient practices to create this modern-day psychomantium. And uh, Dr. Moody is a philosopher, a psychologist, a physician, an author. Uh, he coined the term near-death experiences, like I mentioned. But he has a PhD from the University of Virginia, and he's got a, a medical degree from the Medical College of Georgia. So again, prominent person in the field, really studying paranormal and apparitions and near-death experiences. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what a psychomantium is. I've actually created a psychomantium in my house, uh, in our spare bedroom. I made a psychomantium. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, it was easy to make, um, but I didn't have an experience, so you know I had to tear it down because I think it was the holidays and we had family coming over and my wife didn't want a psychomantium in the spare bedroom when people from out of town were visiting, but. Um, Basically, this picture is a good example of what a psychomantium is. Um, basically, what you do is you, you, you black out your room or you put um, velvet curtains around you, black velvet curtains. Uh, you get a nice, comfortable chair. You put a mirror. Usually, the mirror is about three to four feet long. Um, and then you put the mirror about three to four feet up on the wall. You sit in the chair and you stare at the mirror like up here. So you're not staring at yourself in the mirror like you're looking at yourself, you're actually staring in the mirror into the mirrors reflecting the black surface behind you. Um, you're not in a completely black room. You do have a small amount of light happening, but it's not a significant amount. It's really like a little tiny light bulb or a candle. And then what happens is, is you basically just stare at this, um, at this mirror. And uh, that's what a psychomantium is. Before you go in, you do some meditation. There's a, there's a whole spiel of things you do. But you do some meditation before you go in, and you really concentrate on who you want to contact. So is this uh, uh, your, your grandpa, your grandma, uh, your parent, brother, sister, something like that. And you really concentrate, and you stare up at this mirror that's really into the blackness, uh, and, and uh, apparitions appear. Right? So this is a kind of a fascinating thing. So the typical experiences that a lot of people report is the mirror becomes fuzzy and cloudy and a figure will arrive, which is typically extremely vivid. And sometimes it will be a person they wanted to contact, other times not. Now, of the 300 participants, which Dr. Moody talks about in his book, 50% held conversations with the deceased while they were in the psychomantium. 10% right? believed that the apparition came out of the mirror and seemingly touched the person. 25% of those 300 encountered the apparition actually after they left the psychomantium. Right? <clears throat> and, and a couple people actually believe that they entered into the mirror into another world. So these are very powerful and vivid um, experiences. And this is just an example of one of them. I was sitting in there, and all of a sudden it seemed that these three people stepped right into the room all around me. It looked as if they stepped out of the mirror, but I felt that such a thing couldn't be, so I was shocked. 
I didn't know what was going on. For a moment, I thought it was someone trying to play a joke on me. So I reached up quickly, trying to touch them. And when I did, my hand hit the curtain. I still saw them. I got a, I got a look at all three. My sister Jill was there, but two others, but two others also. My friend Todd and my grand, and my grandfather. All of them looked very much alive, just looking at me. <clears throat> this next example is from a woman who saw, spoke with, and touched her deceased grandfather in the psychomantium. I was so happy to see him that I began to cry. Through the tears, I could see him in the mirror. Then he seemed to get closer, and he must have come out of the mirror because the next thing I knew, he was holding me and hugging me. It felt like he said something like, it's okay, don't cry. So that's a very powerful experience. Now, are these visual encounters in the psychomantium proof of life after death, or are they simply projections of our subconscious? So perhaps it's our unconscious way of processing grief. Uh, seeing or hearing from deceased loved ones saying they're okay helps the grieving process and more or less can improve our psychological well-being. The psychomantium has been around, like I said, since the ancient Greeks. It's taken different forms. Uh, the scrying, the dark mirrors, this takes a little bit of a dark turn into it. Um, I know some people who just stare into mirrors at their own reflections. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. There's not really a right way or a wrong way to do anything. But when, when we look at the psychomantium, the research in that is the research that has a lot of these vivid experiences going on. So uh, when you see someone scrying, when you see someone staring at a mirror on a television show or something like that, uh, this comes all the way back to the psychomantium in the days of uh, the oracles in ancient Greek, uh, in ancient Greece. So really, we talked about how science is sort of moving and progressing. This is another way where now we're taking things that happened in the past, which we all thought were just myths and legends, and we're throwing them in the laboratory, and we're seeing kind of what comes up. Uh, and this is a great example. So these 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 visions that people were having back in ancient Greece, these were actually probably happening. This wasn't just people on hallucin hallucinogens or smoking whatever or anything or just hallucinating or anything like that. These were actual experiences brought on by the psychomantium, which we can sort of reproduce nowadays, which I always think is pretty fascinating. And the last thing we're going to talk about are, are some more people prone to ghostly encounters. We all know that one person that has sees a ghost every day. Right? Um, and then there's that one person who's never seen a ghost. All these people that have paranormal experiences very frequently, and then one person has one in their whole lifetime. So why is one person having all these experiences and another person having no experiences or very minimal experiences? Uh, that's a question that we've always really been trying to answer for a long period of time when it comes to paranormal phenomenon. Why do some people have these experiences and others don't? Sometimes you get into beliefs. Sometimes you get into how people were raised. Then you get into sort of um, uh, cognitive functioning, like uh, their, their uh, ability to uh, misinterpret ambiguous stimuli. There's all these sort of perceptual things that come with it as well. So, you know, as we go through here, what I like to look at is, is a couple of things, right? So let's say that paranormal information is similar to radio waves. So radio waves are all around us. They're floating all over the place. Uh, the only way we really know they exist is when we tune our dial to 92.3, and then our radio resonates with the, um, the radio waves in the air, and then music comes out of our, our stereo, our car system. But if you're walking around the city, why is reception better in one area? Some of us remember adjusting the rabbit ears to our, on our TVs to get a better picture. Why is this adjustment helping with, with, uh, with the TV? Right? What makes this configuration the best? So I encourage others to ask this question when it comes to paranormal phenomena. What makes this location special? Why are par paranormal phenomena happening in this location? Why are certain people having experiences and, other, and others none? What makes this, you, this witness unique? They aren't having these experiences at work or at McDonald's. Why here? Why now? So we really look at some of these very specific questions. Now, environmental sensitivity, I talked about this earlier. 
this is I did a lot, I did my research when I was in Scotland on this, uh, and then basically it's this idea that some individuals are more prone to ghostly encounters. However, their increased probability of having ghostly encounters isn't really related to this sort of psychic sensitivity, um, it, but rather something as simple and concrete as our ability to taste, touch, and smell. And what I'm talking about is environmental sensitivity. So there's a certain part of the population that are more prone to paranormal phenomena. And these, these people are affected by and react to the environment in different ways. Now, past research really suggests that the environment impacts certain individuals more than others, which leads to environmental conditions and dysfunctions. So when I say environmental sensitivity, uh, it's... <clears throat> These, these types of people are just really sensitive to the environment that's around them. I'm not talking about ghosts. I'm just talking about the environment in general. So they typically have longstanding allergies. They have chronic pain. They have really sensitive, they're really sensitive to lights, sounds, and smells. Uh, they have a lot of migraines, and they have fatigue. So I'll give you an example. I, I could walk into a room. I could be under fluorescent lights. I could be next to a guy that has two bottles of Old Spice on and I could be sitting in a chair that's just been cleaned with bleach, and it doesn't really impact me at all. Right? Another person could walk in, they can get headaches from the fluorescent lighting, they can get nauseous and um, uh, have sort of allergic reactions to the old spice, and they can get a rash from the bleach that's a, a cleaning agent on the, the chair. This person is just really, really sensitive to the environment. They're picking up on things and they're impacted by things that sometimes the general population, such as myself, just never really registers. Sometimes these people, there's been a lot of, uh, I saw a recent documentary on Netflix about people who are electromagnetically sensitive. So they're picking up on EMFs in the area that some people just really never pick up on. So imagine just having your, your senses sort of bombarded with the environment around you. It would be challenging to work in certain places, right? If you're, uh, if you're sort of really sensitive to the environment, like fluorescent lights and chemicals and smells, this would be really challenging. But what we found is when, when we look at these people with environmental sensitivity, they generally, uh, I think the number is 70% of those people who are environmentally sensitive have had a paranormal experience, which is a huge, a huge number. So the idea is why? Why are these people having more experiences? And, and that's what I tried to find out when I was over in, in Scotland. Uh, so we had this questionnaire that really categorized people as either being very sensitive to the environment that is around them or environmentally sensitive, and then sort of general population. And, and when we did that, when we, when we were able to categorize them, what we found was uh, that those who were categorized as environmentally sensitive, they had 55, 55% of them had past paranormal experiences. Uh, now, when we looked at non-sensitives, 26% of them had a past paranormal experience. So that's a significant difference. 55% of the environmental sensitive, 55% of those who are environmentally sensitive had a past paranormal experience. 26% of those who weren't environmentally sensitive or general population had a past experience. Right? So this is what we look at, just looking at sort of their past experiences and asking them these questions. But what happens when we take them inside an actual haunted location? So that's what I did. I took 260 participants, uh, and uh, what we did was we had a haunted location in, Sc in Scotland called Mary King's Close. Uh, this is a pretty popular one. It's been on all the ghost hunting shows, Most Haunted, and, and um, I'm sure a lot of the ones here in America as well. But it's basically um, an underground city in Scotland, in Edinburgh. Uh, a lot of times the, the, the poor or the lower class were living sort of underground because the, the city was so populated. So people had apartments there. They had businesses down there. Uh, supposedly, when the plague hit, they walled people up down there and they died. I don't know how much truth there is to that, but uh, a lot of bad things happened down there nonetheless. So it's got a, a pretty good reputation of being haunted. So what I did was I took, uh, gosh, I don't even remember, uh, 260 people, uh, and we took them through Mary King's Close. So what we did was before they went through Mary King's Close, we gave them a little questionnaire. 
The questionnaire just basically categorized them as being environmentally sensitive or not. Then they went through the haunted, the, the haunted location and they had a little checklist with them and if they had an experience, they would check off, yeah, I had an experience. Right. So of the 260 some people who went through, we had 601 experiences reported. So that means people were having multiple experiences. Uh, a lot of vivid ones too, uh, tactile stuff, people pulling at their pants, uh, apparitions, uh, sense of presence, orbs, energy, change in temperature, all these types of things. So we had 601 experiences to really go for. But what we were looking at is what was the difference between the sensitives and the non-sensitives. So we look at the data here. Of the sensitives, they averaged 3.6 experiences per trip through the haunted location. And then non-sensitives averaged 1.9. Now that number doesn't seem really too different, but it's what we call significantly significant. So that doesn't happen by chance is, is more or less what that means. There's a really, 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 really low chance that that would just happen by random, those numbers. So that usually means there's something to it. So the, the, the question we always ask is, you know, why? Why are sensitives having, environmentally sensitive people having more experiences? I don't know, I don't know if I have the answer to that uh, definitively, but I think there could be picking up on something that the general population just is not. Now, is this misinterpreting ambiguous stimuli in the area? Um, I don't know. So if I'm really sensitive to magnetic fields or EMFs or electricity, whatever you want to say, uh, and I walk into a room and there's high amounts of EMFs, I could interpret sort of the physical symptoms I get from that to being paranormal, uh, possibly. Um, you know, Michael Jower, who is the person who is sort of the, the person who's brought this environmental sensitivity into the paranormal world, believes that what we believe is as ESP is basically an individual's highly refined ability to fix on a range of stimuli that never really registers with the general population. So in other words, they're just picking up on things that the general population does not. Uh, perhaps the, the people who are sensitive to magnetic fields just pick up on signals in the local magnetic field. Um, you know, it's there's so many questions to it, but it's this idea of you know, ghosts are sort of related to magnetic fields in a lot of books and research and things like that. You know, um, you know, are there electromagnetic traces in the environment that that um, sort of people pick up on? You know, it's you know, bacteria leaves behind measurable energetic traces that contain significant information. The idea is if bacteria can leave that behind. Shouldn't people be able to leave it behind too? Um, and so there's all kinds of questions that come up, but the results basically say that people who are environmentally sensitive reported significantly more past paranormal experiences than non-sensitives. And sensitives reported significantly more haunt-type experiences in a haunted location, Mary King's Close, than non-sensitives as well. So, you know, this is something that as, as we walk through and as paranormal investigators who may be listening to this sort of go to a location whether it's um, residential or just a standard location. Um, you know, I think it's really interesting, you know, you have two people in the same location. Why did this person have the experience? Why did this one not? What makes them different? You know, why, what's different between this person and this person? Is it their emotions? Is it their perceptions? Is it their belief? Is it their biological makeup? Uh, all these sort of things really go through my head when people have experiences. Uh, and I, th and I, I really think that some of the stuff we talked about today is really science sort of building up to this. You know, I think 10, about 10, 15 years ago, everyone thought, well, it's just the environment messing with people and it's causing them to believe they have um, paranormal experiences, right? Uh, e EMFs messing with their brain, infrasound impacting their eyeballs to where they're hallucinating, um, you know, creaks and crawls and creepy spaces making people anxious that led to ghosts. And, and, and that research has really been scattered. 
In other words, it's not consistent. Um, so the environmental variables that are happening around us, that's not the answer to the question. Then you move on to, you know, what is the answer to the question? Well, maybe it's the people, correct? Or maybe it's the mixture of the people and the environment. So there's a lot of great people out there doing a lot of great research and posing a lot of great questions on this when it comes to haunted houses. Um, as far as things go here, you know, why? It could be the environmentally sensitive people are just picking up or noticing that the non-sensitives cannot. What they're picking up and noticing, I don't know. I can't say for sure. People would look at that. There could be a supernatural explanation or there could be a natural explanation for it. Um, so what are they picking up on? Um, well, that's actually, if you want to know more about that, that's really where my book, The Ghost Studies, sort of talks about. I have a lot of theories about that. I have a lot of research on what I think is happening with that. Um, you know, what, what environmentally sensitive people are picking up on. Um, the ghost studies is is out there. You can it's on Audible, it's on uh, Amazon, uh, those types of things. Michael Jower is another person who has a lot of great books out there. He's sort of the person who got me into thinking like this and sort of led to all my um, writings and things. But he has a book called The Spiritual Anatomy of Emotion, which is like this thick, and it's really a great read for anyone interested in sort of diving really deep into um, the connection between biology and paranormal phenomenon. And he has a new book all ca called The Sensitive Soul, which is another great book that sort of links a lot of biological uh, mechanisms and diagnoses and all this stuff with the paranormal and how they go hand in hand. Uh, if, if you want to know more about me, um, Haunted Theories is my website. You can find me at Facebook on Haunted Theories, Twitter Haunted Theories. I'm all over the place. Haunted Theories was the name of my book um, before the publisher changed it, but I already made all my Facebook stuff, uh, and I never really changed that part of it. So I like Haunted Theories better, but The Ghost Studies is still not a bad title as well. And, and that's pretty much it for me. I'll see if I can get out of this sharing thing. Hopefully I, I didn't put Phil or Heather to sleep, and they're still around. You, you, you would never put me to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking notes. Uh, I want to ask. Yeah. All right. It's nice to see people again. I was just staring at a black screen. <laughs> I, was, I thought maybe everyone just left. So um, a couple questions from the chat if Heather wants to ask those, and then I've got my 40 questions I, I want to ask you. Not yeah, 40. I'm going to scroll back through the best I can, trying to remember what we were talking about when some of these questions were asked. Oh, so yeah. we might need some help to say this. Well, the, there's one in particular that I remember. Oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> this was asked when you were talking about more and more people are believing in ghosts. Yeah, I, I do think it's becoming more acceptable. When I was when I was 15 years old, I hid my parapsychology books underneath my bed like they were dirty magazines. <laughs> um, <laughs> nowadays, parents nowadays, like dirty, dirty magazines. Yeah, nowadays, I think a lot of the ghost shows have made it more acceptable to talk about. You know, millions of millions of people watch these shows. So it's conversation starters. Uh, and anytime something's really in the media, it also could lead to academics and researchers studying it too. Uh, and I think it's just more acceptable because the more we talk about it, the more we realize either we've had an experience or someone close to us has had an experience. Um, you know, my, my 95-year-old grandmother, I had... No idea she knew anything about the paranormal. My book came out, and she told me about this amazing um, sort of uh, telepathy experience. Wow. Right? And I was just blown away by it because it was so graphic and vivid, and uh, I just I had no idea. But she felt comfortable because I wrote a book on ghosts to come out and talk. You know, so I think that that really makes it more acceptable, and I think that's maybe why the numbers are up there. You ask somebody, you give somebody a questionnaire 40 years ago and it says, do you believe in ghosts? They might go, well, maybe they're going to track me or so this is going on some sort of, so they might just put no, even though they actually believe in it. I think it's more acceptable now. So there was one question um, about what scientific community, was that it? Did you get it? Yeah. 
there, okay. it was for the scientific community to come to a place where they can conclude ghosts exist. And then the same person followed up with what needs to be done for our field to be taken more seriously. Could they get to a place where they can conclude that, that ghosts exist? Well, you know, I talked about the soul phone, right? I mean, if, if what they're saying is true, that would probably put you in conclusive evidence. Um, so developing a machine where you can talk to the, a deceased person and get answers that aren't just like, I hear an M, I see a Q or, or something like that, like actual conversations. I think that's right now, that's probably the closest thing we'll get to conclusive evidence. Conclusive evidence is, is a tough one to really pin down, you know, like coming from psychology, um, somebody says they love their wife. Can, can they conclusively prove that they love their wife? What's the, what's the standard for it to be scientific? It has to be traceable, replicable. And I mean, like we'd have to produce a ghost. I mean, is that what they expect? Yeah. Yeah. You want it to be reliable. You want the research to be valid. Validity and reliability are the two things. So consistency, um, you have to rule out all kinds of variables. But it's usually not one one study. It has to be replicated by other people as well. So yeah. it's not just one person putting it out. They have to put their research out to everyone else, and then they try it, and it has to go on and on and on. Um, that's why I'm really interested in the cell phone, and I'm really surprised it hasn't been really generating more interest on Facebook. Um, I don't have any. I don't have any stake in it. So yeah, I put the link for, uh, for his Dr. Schwartz's um, website in the chat room. Yeah. If nothing else, it's his books are really interesting to read, um, and all those types. Of I hope I answered uh, Joe's question. I want to talk about something in your book. Um, something I, I found really interesting. It's um, ghostly ingredients theory. The three things that need to happen for us to have a ghostly experience and first of all our ghostly encounter but will you define what you mean by ghostly encounter for everyone so they'll understand it who who haven't read the book if you have it yeah, yeah. so, so ghostly encounter uh, is 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 sort of a catch-all so if you ask somebody have you had a ghostly experience not a lot of people say yeah i saw a full body apparition in front of me a lot of times it's a sense of presence it's um like an uncontrollable emotion when you enter a room. Uh, sometimes it's um, tactile phenomenon, like tugging of the shirt. Sometimes it's um, hearing audible things. Uh, sometimes it could just be a change in temperature. Sometimes it could be a smell that they get when they walk into a certain room. So what defines a ghost is different. And when you look at the actual numbers on this, more people have this sense of presence than they do actually seeing a visual apparition. So a ghostly encounter or haunt type phenomenon is basically all those spectrums or all those uh, that continuum of experiences. So a ghost is just not seeing exactly. an apparition, if you want to say it like that. Um, and the, the ghostly ingredients theory is, is um, something in my book which um, kind of goes over what I think is is probably most prominent when people have ghostly encounters and it's it's a mixture of um, psychological aspects plus biological aspects plus sort of environmental aspects so usually it's not just one thing it's having a um, a truly supernatural event is a complex process of numerous things happening it has to do with our emotions. It has to do with our internal sort of makeup. And it has to do with how we react to the environment. Because what we're seeing is external, supposedly. Um, even if it's coming from internal, it's still external. So uh, I, I, what, the go, what the book says is all these things really have to come into place. Uh, and it's kind of a complicated um, process. And even the chapters I talk about it, I, 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 I go step by step through it and it's it's still a I, know, I still i still think it's a complicated thing to explain like in a sound bite yes. um, you know but uh, i think if you're interested in it and most people sort of already know it's a combination of all these things that are happening but to to sort of pin it down and break it down is is helpful for a lot of people me myself included um 
And in your book, you talk about your friend at 14 who told you about his experience. Did you have any personal experiences that moved you into this field other than just um, psychology and, and therapy for you know people? Did it, anything happen that moved you to the ghostly side? You know, I, I don't have a cool story. And you don't have I, a cool yeah, I, because, you know, the, when when the when the guy asked me, or the kid, I guess, because we were kids, when he asked me, you know, what is a ghost? You know, I never really thought about it. You know, I was always sort of interested in ghosts and I read about them, but I never really thought, what is a ghost or what causes a ghost? And then I, when I get a question inside my head and I can't get the answer, then I usually just research and go to the library. And at that time, there was no Google. So, you know, just get as much information as you can. And that led me down the path of psychology. That psychology led me down the path of parapsychology. And then, you know, here we are today. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not one of those people that has had experiences, but I don't, and I hope I made this clear, I don't discount experiences by any means. I'm not a, a debunker. debunker. I'm not a person who's trying to do that. Uh, I think any experience is something to look into. Um, you work in a hospital and with people who are, you know, in, in emotional crisis situations. Have you ever come across someone who you thought maybe was having a paranormal experience? And with your knowledge in parapsychology, was was able to to see that? But, I mean, that would be hard for you to say, you know, they're not having a crisis because of this. They're you know, seeing a ghost. I mean, mm -hmm. does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, um, I yes, I've seen it uh, numerous times. Uh, there's there's actually uh, a branch. I'll call it a branch, but there's a sort of a movement in parapsychology to formulate more sort of protocols for what they call clinical parapsychology, which is really counseling for people who've had experiences, right? So, let's say you had sort of a, a precognitive experience. And you have this dream that, you know, your mother's going to die in a plane accident. And two days later, your mom dies in a plane accident, right? There is a lot of stuff <laughs> that can go through your head. At that, you know what I'm saying? A lot of emotional, there's guilt, there's regret, there's all kinds of things. Now, anytime you have an experience, you also whether it's having a ghostly experience or a precognitive experience or telepathy, there's some sort of psychological, I don't want to say damage, but confusion related to it. And I think sometimes clinical parapsychology would really help a person better understand what might be happening um, and how frequent it is. And you can direct people towards education on it and support type things. Um, now, I think the TV really portrays ghostly encounters as being these horrible negative entities that are sucking our souls right out of us right yeah but the research really says that most people who have paranormal experiences while they're initially frightening in the long haul it's actually positive right they're more spiritual um it it can kind of motivate them to do things um yes. and there's this sense of hey maybe there is something after me so there's more hope in that way so initially frightening Long term, a lot of positives that can come out of having a ghostly experience. Yeah, I mean, several years ago, I had an experience where, I, I mean, it was pretty frightening when it happened because it mm -hmm. was physical. And I, I mean, I had a bit of PTSD afterwards. I mean, I could not believe what happened had just happened. And I had friends who were there that saw it happen calling me, Are you okay? Are you going to, are you going to leave? Are you not, you know, and I, after, a, I worked through it. It just completely changed the way I thought about the whole paranormal situation. Exactly. Yeah. And um, yeah, I found that really fascinating. And that's why I'm really into the science part because I want to know how what happened to me was even possible. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> how was that possible? But um, speaking of energy and getting hit with it, um, you use bioenergetic a lot in your book which I, I love yeah. and because uh, I think the whole world works with frequency and sound and vibration and I think that's probably going to be the answer to a lot of things one day but will you tell people what about bioenergetic 
just what it is? Sure. So um, bioenergetics or bioenergy has been around for a long period of time. Uh, it's basically sort of it's basically sort of the the internal the energy that our body sort of makes, right? We're all electrical beings, uh, and this is this is fact. This isn't science fiction. EEGs are looking at our electrical impulses. Um, uh, EKGs, uh, the, uh, the heart monitors, all these things are sort of looking at sort of our internal electrical impulses and our biological makeup down there. So we're electrical beings. And as electrical beings, it's important to know that things that happen to us also impact us internally or our, our, our internal electrical system, if you want to think about it like that. So our emotions could impact our internal electrical system. Um, uh, things that happen from the outside, like punches and trauma, can impact our internal electrical system. Uh, but crisis events also impact our internal electrical system. And we all know that electricity isn't just encapsulated inside of us. It also extends outward as well. And this has been proven in, to some degree uh, with um, very, very, very delicate machines which show that we do give off, you know, um, electromagnetic fields as humans. It's not intense numbers. It's very minimal numbers. But if what happens inside us you know, sort of permeates into the environment. Once it gets out of us, like field-wise, then it can go all over the universe. So I think we forget that we're electrical beings and we're impacted by things that happen around us. You know, the, the moon can impact, the lunar phases could impact waves. This is This is all stuff where we sort of take for granted. We all see ourselves as these little bubbles that go around the world. But I don't think we realize that the world uh, impacts us, and we impact the world to some degree. So that collective consciousness type of thing. Sure. Um, yeah. Now, our you know, like you said, our emotions affect our electrical balance and makeup in our body. Like, um, do you think different emotions would have a different frequency? Like, fear would be different from happiness or anger would be different from fear because if we're because you know the thoughts are we're emitting this emf does this emf contain the dna that can be interpreted into information by somebody else like the cell phone signal Is yeah that yeah so if if i'm in a crisis situation and i'm feeling all these emotions um and it sort of leaks out of me and into the environment and connects with you know, my brother an hour away, that's telepathy to some degree. Um, but do they do they have different frequencies? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I think we're still really early in, the, in sort of determining, like, how to measure bioenergy, you know. Um, back, uh, there's a thing called the L field or the life field, which, which is... Uh, Harold Saxton Burr wrote a whole book on the blueprint blueprint for immortality where he had a machine that was sort of able to to some degree predict your emotions like uh, the machine was kind of cool because it would predict how well a seed would grow <laughs> by looking at its voltage right so it could take a seed and it could say, oh, this seed's going to be really good because of the voltage is doing this. And then they plant the seed and it'd do really well. And then the other ones would say it wouldn't do well and then the seed wouldn't do well. But what he found was sometimes even in, in humans when they were measuring humans' emotions, um, that when someone was angry, the voltage went a certain way. When someone was happy, the voltage went a certain way. But one of the things they found was that not everyone was consistent. So everyone's unique. So you have to sort of get a baseline for what a person is before you can make any judgments on that. So your anger might be really high. The voltage would be really high. My anger might be, my voltage would be really low. Mm. Now his stuff was a long time ago. There really hasn't been too much to replicate that. Um, 
there's I saw a recent article where they talked about how innovative it was, uh, but I don't really know where that's going uh, or why it didn't go further. Um, people have a lot of thoughts on that, but I'm not sure. But that that sort of answers your question a little bit, I hope. Yeah, and uh, you know, it can also play into how psychics and mediums work if they're reading these EMF books that contain this information. That can be yeah. how they, they're getting it. That their 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 cell phone and that cell phone are meeting, getting the right signal. Um, like yeah, that, reson resonating with somebody. That's yeah. It's it, it, uh, entanglement is sort of the fancy word for mm -hmm. telepathy or resonating. There, but there's in the book I go over some research articles from Persinger, who when they found when they had a they had a psychic, um, and they found that when they put EEGs on, I think it was EEGs, EEGs on the psychic and the person that he was reading, and they found that when their EEGs synchronated or resonated or came together that he was more accurate in his readings. Yeah. So that's an interesting sort of take on this. So there's some sort of synchronization happening or resonance. Or what, what I, can't, I can't remember what he called it, but and that's when information was, was transferred. transferred. So maybe that's what telepathy is. Maybe it's just synchronizing with somebody at a certain moment and then information being passed or transferred. Um, the, the good stuff to read. Uh, the, the, I mean, this is academic research. I love it. Uh, but this is something that is really it's out there um, and to some degree I mean none of this stuff is hidden I mean some of it is I guess the CIA stuff <laughs> from, from yeah. years ago I, although that's becoming declassified now too I think so yeah there, there was actually aliens they say yeah um, they, they had a whole project uh, for 15 years on remote viewing the uh, government yes, did. absolutely um, which I started doing some remote viewing classes and it got into the gestalts and all that. And I was like, okay, this is too much. That sounds intense. Yeah. Um, Heather, are there any questions? I, Cause I've got something else I want to ask him. Yeah. There's a other more that came okay. up. Here's another one from Joseph. Would you discuss the limitations of common scientific arguments, theories, use of the book? Uh, which is the limitations of common scientific arguments and theories used in the book. Um, gosh, there's so many. Um, <laughs> it always is. Uh, you know, I think I talked about this briefly. Was a lot of it. A lot of it was it's environmental that's causing the problems. Um, mold. I, I always read. Uh, you know, the top five things. Um, Top five reasons people see ghosts, and mold always seems to be one of those. Um, there's no research into mold causing ghostly encounters. Um, zero that I can find. Um, it's just a common myth. Um, you know, I think a lot of times people will say uh, a common argument or theory is is mental illness um, causes paranormal experiences cognitive deficits so you know uh, all these sort of fancy words that are out there uh, you can you could really go either way with it there was one that always said like um, the more education people have the less um, belief in ghosts and experiences that they have but that's not true I can point to four or five studies that say the complete opposite the more education you have, the, the more paranormal experience that are happening to you. So it's this socio-cultural, this idea that, you know, if you are raised in a house that believed in ghosts, you have a ghost. And the one I hear all the time is people's testimony is such subject to flaws. You know, people don't believe, people are never accurate on describing what they see right this you know um, people forget people put stuff in yeah you know i i mean subjective testimony or subjective experiences is used 
everywhere, like with these vaccines. That's how they know if people are having symptoms because people are telling them they're having symptoms. <laughs> yeah. So if we, okay, let's take that as scientific evidence. But when another person says they have an experience, well, they're just misinterpreted. They don't, that's just witnesses. They're flawed thinking. And yeah. I always thought that was a lame theory. Um, so I think that answers your question. I just use the word lame. I haven't used lame and I don't think I've ever used lame. <laughs> and this question was brought up when you were talking about the psychomantium. Oh. I'm assuming she's saying that it's similar to sensory deprivation with a portal is kind of like what you were explaining. Uh, is that rosy? That's, that's kind of a cool way of saying it, but yeah, I, I would, I would sort of agree with that. Um, uh, it, but you're not really, I guess it is a portal because things are coming through it. Um, but it is sensory deprivation. I, I will agree with you with that. So you're in a dark room with a little bit of light staring into a mirror that's reflecting a dark surface. Um, you know, I, I think our minds can play tricks as, with us in that sort of environment because you're really sort of inducing something. But then again, you know, if you read these books, uh, people are having experiences where they're learning things they say they didn't know, you know. So is that some sensory deprivation? Like, how are they getting information that you don't know? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. With this psychomantium experiment, um, you know, the power of suggestion is really strong. Were, do you know if they were told what to expect, what to look for, what to do, like contact, you know, your relatives. What were they given when they were put in there? Yeah. So um, a doc, uh, Raymond Moody's book has a whole like protocol for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't remember the name of it. He's had several books, but the, the protocol basically is, and I, w when I did the psychomanium, I did the protocol as close as, as I could. So you don't, you don't drink any caffeine that day or the day before, I think. You eat a light breakfast and lunch, so it's like salads and fruits. Oh, I'm out. <laughs> 15 minutes, was it 15 or 30 minutes before, or I'm sorry, for the the day previous and the day of, when you go into psychomantium, you're supposed to think about uh, uh, the person you wanna contact. Okay. You're actually supposed to talk about that person, go over some memories, uh, and then the 15 minutes before you want to do some meditation. And then obviously when you're sitting there, you want to think about it as well. So you are focusing on a person that you want to talk to, uh, cause that's the person that you want to come through the mirror. But again, I think one of the examples I gave the person they thought about didn't come through the mirror. Right. And then sometimes the experiences were happening after they left the psychomantium chamber. So. Well, this, I mean, you know, this makes me think of like a Ouija board. You're opening up invitation. You know, just because you invite a certain person doesn't mean that's the person that's going to come through. So people who are into, you know, all of that are going to say, well, if I go in there and look at that mirror and I'm wanting grandma to come through, you know, Zozo may come through. I mean, yeah. Uh yeah, it's 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 fascinating whether it's supernatural or natural, like Rosie was talking about, sensory deprivation. Yeah. If it, it can lead to these experiences too, but at the same time, you know, like you said, we don't want to rule out everything and say that, you know. But you know, like a Ouija board is another thing. People will say, well, it's idiomotor effect, or it's people moving a thing around, and then other people have these legitimate experiences. Um, so it's it's so hard to pinpoint like yes conclusively this is happening yeah. so you know you just continue to for me i i didn't get any experiences when i did the psychomantium you know i i don't know why um but i did everything i thought i needed to do um have you only done it once did you only try it once i did i actually had a I, it took me I think it was a day to set the room up. And I didn't really, I didn't think about it. It was the holidays and everything. Like my wife was really supportive of it, but um, you know, you don't want this dark room with. Uh, it's just, it looks weird. Oh, you have, <laughs> <laughs> well, you got family coming over. It's like, what's what's going on in this room? Yeah, I have to, I have to, I have to, when I have company, so 
Yeah, and then I got to explain what cyclomantium is, and then it just turns into a whole. And then I know on the drive home they'll be talking about how I have a, a weird. That you're or, wondering the devil in your house. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's what it turns into sometimes. Right? So any, I, yeah. <laughs> any, any other ones, Heather? Because there's one more thing I want to ask him about before I. Yeah, the only other question, and I'm not really sure if it's a question or just a statement, but Bonnie brings up an idea that the people she's encountered that have abilities seem to have some sort of underlying medical condition, mm -hmm. where those that she's run into that have only been like sick with a cold or something really don't have any abilities or experiences. Is that something that you found to be true? Well, people... What we found, and it's uh, Michael Jower has done more research into this, and Michael Michael Shallis actually had a book too in the '80s about this. But what he found was people who have these really significant allergies had way more experiences. People with fibromyalgia, people with migraines, people with uh, they call them environmental illnesses. So that's multiple chemical sensitivity. Um, there was a couple other, there was a handful of other sort of medical issues that sort of related to having more paranormal experiences. Um, so there does seem to be some sort of correlation there. Um, he found that people that, when you look at people with severe allergies, they're sort of, and he's talking about severe allergies where they were in the hospital and almost like allergic to water, like everything was impacting them. So their immune systems, they were very compromised medically. They were having a lot more experiences in, in Michael Chalice's book. Um, were they at a, a particular location or them just in general in their lives? In general, just in general. Okay. Like he found people that were pretty medically compromised were having way more experiences. Okay. Um, uh, the Electric Connection, I think, is Michael Chalice's book. It's from, it's 83. It's, it's. Mm. Almost like he wrote it today. <laughs> a lot of stuff he's talking about kind of pertains to today. It's creepy. Um, something I wanted to ask you about that I think people will find interesting, um, the, your SATT theory, the spontaneous apparitional trace theory. Mm -hmm. It's how a location can be haunted without a horrible death happening there. Mm -hmm. But this is, would not be a ghost when you read it there's not a ghost there it's information yeah. is there can you go into that a little bit I just, this fascinates me yeah so uh, a lot of times uh, when you're looking at books or talk or looking at tv shows or talking to people uh, and they go over a ghostly experience they sort of trace it back to something tragic must have happened at that location exactly. for there to be some sort of entity there um so that theory kind of says you can't have spirits and new houses or how or places where there's no tragedy that's been occurred um, so what i talk about in my book is there's this idea of um, so when i'm having a crisis event there's things called crisis apparitions everyone's heard of these this is this idea where you know i'm, I'm sitting at home reading a book and an apparition of my aunt comes right in front of me and she says i love you goodbye and then she vanishes and then I find out the next day that she died at that exact same time I had that apparition occur in front of me, right? There's no way I should have known that. Uh, statistically, to have my only apparition of her happen at the moment of her death has got to be astronomical. Um, so it's this idea that somehow she communicated to me at her time of crisis when she was passing on, right? So this she lives in, in Colorado, and she communicated to me all the way in Ohio. I had this vision of my aunt in Ohio in front of me, right? So what I call that is this telepathic distress signal that was sent to me, right? So let's say, and this is my house, there's no, been no tragedies in my house, it's, it's a, nothing's ever happened here. Let's say 20 years in the future, new people move into my house uh, and they start experiencing this apparition of a woman just showing up saying i love you and then disappearing right and they call in the the paranormal investigators and they get evps saying um of a woman saying i love you maybe they catch a glimpse of her maybe they get an emotion of overwhelming sadness when they're in the room um are they picking up on the ghost of my deceased aunt she didn't die in the house 
You know, it was just a crisis telepathic distress signal that was sent. But perhaps this telepathic distress signal is sort of lingering somehow in the environment, and people are picking up on that rather than an actual ghost. So if they're sensitive enough, if they have equipment that's sensitive enough, they're picking up on this sort of telepathic distress trace that's been in the, in the location. So maybe this also could be picked up at the location of where my aunt was when she passed away too. So they could, could be the same ghost in two different locations, right? Um, I think that accounts for a lot. And, and I think that, you know, and I give a lot of examples in the book of, of when we trace back stories, we find out that the actual cause or trigger to the ghostly apparition was not someone dying in the house, but rather someone who died somewhere else and sort of communicated to somebody in the house telepathically during this crisis apparition. So that sort of boiled down as best I could. Well, I think this is so important for investigators to know is because we're usually looking for uh, an intelligent haunting, you know, or a residual haunting where something tragic happened. It didn't have to be tragic, but something in the house that's imprinted yeah. from somebody that's lived there. And then how many times have we come across, I'm talking to the investigators, of a client reporting seeing something and we can't find any history of anyone dying in the house, mm. blah, blah, blah. This is a great explanation of what mm. could have happened. There could have been, this could have been the reason. I think, you know, we, and we don't ever think about those. We're like, well, nobody's died in this house. Why is there, why are they seeing this? They must have an attachment. Yeah. And, and I think that comes back to, cause this is not, you, you know, this, this is, this is psi. This is sort of telepathy. Huh? This is vertical hallucinations is what they yeah. used to call them back in the old days. So this has been going on a while, these crisis operations. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we think of it as this otherworldly external entity that's sort of trying to get us but we don't realize that sometimes the most fascinating things just happen between two people's minds yeah. in the environment you know it doesn't have to be this discarnate entity that's hanging around messing with people or yeah. demon or whatever you want to call it i mean i was trying to think of a way you know analogy of really like I, I i'm freaking out about something i send you a telegraph you receive that telegraph you read it, you put it in a drawer, you move away 20 years later, that telegraph's still in that drawer. I mean, yeah, kind yeah. Of that way. exactly. Yeah. And then other people can read that telegraph or, yeah. you know, kind of get the emotion that you had when you, when you sent it, get an idea of where your mind was at, what was going on there. Oh, just fascinating. My, my head explode. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's, it's fun. It's really fun to think of outside the box. Well, you know, it's not, you know, we're out here chasing these things, ghosts, blah, blah, blah. We need to know exactly what it is we are chasing. You know, we're trying to figure that out and, and how it's possible that they're there for us to chase. That's what's important to me. How is this possible? Hmm. You know, and I think we need to bring more science. Thank you, which is what you're doing into the paranormal instead of chasing demons constantly, because if life after death exists, I mean, that's that's such an amazing thing to look forward to. I mean, unless you've been a bad person. But um, no, I just think this is, a, you know, we need to look at how these things are possible. Yeah. And your book has really opened my eyes to a lot of ideas. And, and so thank you for writing this book. Thank you. Oh, well, thanks for reading. I appreciate it. I read it three. Well, I have your CDs, and I have <laughs> so I put them in the car. So oh, I'll, that's nice. Yeah. That's easy. It's easy to do that. Love yeah. it. Love it. So yeah. so we're right at time. We need to let you go. Thank your wife for letting us keep you. Oh, she's a because I could like go through your whole book and talk all night long. But <laughs> we'd love to have you come back. I know you have another presentation that you do. Yeah, yeah, that's about actually some of the theories you talked about there. Those are the that's the one I've been doing when we had conferences. Yeah, I can't remember when that was, but yeah. Well, I hope this forum helps people who can't get to the paracons and things. I hope they're they're able to get some good information, and that's that's what we're here for. But yeah. definitely, we want to have you back sometime to do that one for us. Sure, not a problem. Just let me know. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> To you get your vaccine yeah yeah <laughs> all right heather you wanna okay.
say goodbye and get us out of here? Yep. Um, I have Brandon's Facebook page scrolling around along the bottom. Is there anywhere else that they can find you? Do you want to remind them where they can catch you? Uh, hauntedtheories.com, uh, Haunted Theories on Twitter, and Haunted Theories on Facebook. Those are the three best ways. If you have a question or anything, sending it through uh, Facebook is usually the best way to get a hold of me. And your book's on Amazon. Yeah, it's on Amazon. Audible has it as well. Uh, those are the, the two best places to, to get it. Most people go through Amazon, I would guess. Yeah. The Kindle, it's on Kindle. Okay. All right. And you guys can follow us. You guys are already probably watching us on Ghost Education 101. And you can catch the replay on YouTube under Ghost Education 101. Hopefully, we'll have that up by tomorrow morning. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Brandon, for coming. Yep, thanks for having me. The presentation. Mm -hmm. We will be live again on March 3rd at 9 p.m. Eastern, where we'll be featuring four more of our educators in a roundtable where you guys can ask any questions you guys have. So again, thank you everyone for joining us, and we will see you next time. All right. Thank you.